Welcome to A Man's Journey Through Divorce, where we talk about real divorce challenges and share practical tools to help you move not only through divorce, but beyond. I'm your host, Steve Schlupner, owner of Utree, and I want to thank you once again for taking some time to listen in. Last week, I traveled down to Maryland to do some work uh, for my financial planning business and to also uh, connect with some old friends. Actually, when you're in Vermont, it's also to get out of the state and experience a little bit warmer weather this time of year. But one of the things that, that I, one of the meetings I had was with a, a podcast listener. It was the first time that I, I met, met him, and I know you're listening, and I, I really had a great talk with you. We, um, he had been referred to my podcast and also had agreed to give me some feedback on the assessment that I had um, uh, asked you guys to help with a few episodes back. So, you know, I connected. I said, hey, I'm going to be around your hometown. Let's let's connect. And he, he did. And, and we had a great conversation. He shared his story, shared shared a lot of what he was going through. And and I certainly empathize with everything. Um, so as, as I hear more and more of our stories and I compare it to even what I went through, there's so many of us that are going through similar things. The pieces of the story are, are a little bit different, but the core is, is very, very similar. So as we sat outside, we started talking about, you know, the work and what was the reason why I'm, I'm doing this work. And so I shared a story with him that I haven't shared with too many people. And, and he, he inferred that, you know, we should, I should share this story on the podcast and make an episode of it. And quite frankly, after he, he uh, resonated with that story, it's been burning inside of me to share it. So therefore that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this story and, and how it's, it's played a big role in my life. So you know, my, my separation started at the beginning of September and my ex moved out on October 15th, 2016. And, and as you can imagine, like many of you who have been in the early part of a separation, you have many, many things going on. You don't, you're asking a lot of questions. You're not sure how to handle things. Uh, you're trying to look out for any impacts that you could have on your kids and prevent anything. And, and meanwhile, there's a lot of emotions and other uncertainties that are welling up inside you. And for me, speaking for myself, I was trying to hold the pieces together as best I could. And as I sat uh, in my house and I was trying to focus on my work and I was trying to figure out what this new life was going to be and how I was going to move on, and then also, um, you know, at the time I was the one that was at the, the lower step of the ending of an equal. So I was still asking my ex why, and I was trying to get her to go to counseling and do other things that could possibly save the marriage. And, and luckily for me, looking back, luckily she, she didn't give in. She, she kept, she kept firm. And so as I was sitting there in this, this turmoil of a new divorce, and I was losing my focus. I was losing my motivation. I was losing my drive. I just felt weighted down. I made one commitment to myself. And that was to go for a walk every day. Simple as that. Now, I live on top of a smaller mountain. Um, and it's almost exactly a one mile walk from the bottom of the road leading up to my house to where I live. So I committed to myself that I was going to walk this hill every day. Now this hill is a steep hill. I mean, there's a couple switchbacks to get you up it. It's a steep hill. And when you walk it going down, it's nice. You got some nice views that pop around the corners through the trees. But when you turn around and come back that fucker, it's a leg burner and it will, um, 
it will get your heart rate pumping. So that's what I did. Now, in October, you can imagine that things start to get cold, and they get cold quickly. So I walked this hill, many snowy days, windy days, below zero days. I walked this hill a lot. And uh, actually, I still walk it today, and it's, I often sit back and, and thank it for what a great resource it was for me. But anyway, as I, I would walk this hill, probably in, in the later fall, maybe November, I don't know the exact time, I would see this guy that I had met once before at a community party, talk to him briefly, never really got to know him, but I would see him drive down, drive by himself. And something would say to me, each time he passed, you should talk with him. And of course, I had that feeling coming up, but I didn't act on it. I could have easily stopped him said hi, I could have easily walked down to his house and introduced myself and talked to him. But, you know, this feeling was coming up to me and saying, you should talk to him, but I didn't know what it meant. And I was like, okay. But every time he passed, and it was it was several times, I mean, I have to say at least 10 over the, the that period of time, you know, from probably November to the early part of January that our paths crossed, I would get this feeling that you should talk to him. You should talk to him, but I never acted on it. Now, the new year came, and and at the beginning of the new year, um, shortly around, I guess it was around the middle of January, I started seeing this uh, this woman, and she was she was a good resource for me. Um, what I find is funny when you when you start to date somebody, it's it's amazing how the other person can really shine a light on you. Like they can really highlight the brilliance and the great qualities you have um, because you were so used to your ex not shining that on you. Uh, And it can be very, very attractive. Um, It also can be the thing that, that causes you to jump maybe too quickly. But I started seeing her and, and we had this connection and, and she would shine this light on me this light of brilliance. And, and of course she was going through a divorce and I was going through a divorce. So we were oftentimes talking about our situations on that front. And then I had shared with her some things about my past and things I went through since the time my parents divorced. And, and I shared with her some many, many personal things. And, um, she was always amazed like what I went through. She would always say to me like, Steve, it's amazing that, um, you, you made it to where you are. And, uh, I just really gave it no creed, but then she would say things like, you know, I don't know if you, if you see this, but I think, I think you should be helping men. Now at the time I was, um, I was a financial advisor. That's what I did. You know, my work was around supporting my family. I had clients, I had other people that I was committed to helping and, And I was like, well, I don't know how I would help men, but I'm a financial advisor. That's where I need to do my work. That's where I need to spend my time. And, and I was committed to walking this hill. So let's fast forward to the middle of February and it's a snowy morning in Vermont. And I didn't go into the office that day. Um, I decided to work from home and, uh, but in the morning I, I hit the gym and as I was coming back from the gym, something said, go in for breakfast, go into McCarthy's and have breakfast. And, uh, never really would eat breakfast out, but I went in and I opened the door. The restaurant was partially full. The counter was empty except for one stool. And as I walked closer, I, I look at the stool and lo and behold, it's this guy who had been driving past me in the car. And I kind of just chuckled and I said, okay, I'm going to go up and talk to him. So I went down and sat next to him. And it's kind of weird when you, you know, you have a big empty counter and, and you're, you're, you're a guy and there's another guy sitting there and you come up and sit on the stool right next to him. Right. It's like the same, it's like the same mentality where you don't look at each other in the, as you're, 
as you're standing at the urinal, you just don't look at each other. But here I come in and I, I sit down next to this guy and I said, look, um, I met you once before you live in my neighborhood. Um, uh, my name's Steve. How are you doing? And he was like, fine. Um, have a seat. So we sat down and, uh, I ordered breakfast and in our conversation, he said, you're married to, I'm not, I'm not going to say her name on the podcast to give her that privacy, but you're married. And, um, I said, well, no, actually I'm, I'm, you know, kind of in the early stages of, of a divorce. And he's like, I'm sorry to hear that. He's like, actually, um, my divorce was just finalized yesterday. I was like, really? I didn't know that. And, uh, he goes, yeah, I lost everything. I lost my kids. I lost my house. Um, I lost my job. I lost everything. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He was like, well, he went into his story and, and he said that my father and I had business interests together and real estate interests together. That's what we did. And we had moved, I had moved from Boston up to Vermont and they actually had moved in around the same time that, that my ex and I moved into the neighborhood. It's what I found. And it was weird because their house when they moved in needed a lot of work and took up a lot of their money and same thing happened with my house. So I had this, this common theme working with him. I really understood him, but he said, my, my father-in-law and I had these real estate and business interests together. And as we're going through the divorce, I'm trying to pay for the attorney and everything. My father-in-law slaps this civil lawsuit on me. And I don't know if the lawsuit was legitimate or, or what, but he just said that it just pinched me financially. I couldn't afford to fight the lawsuit and pay for the attorneys at the same time. I was going broke and, and we didn't, I didn't have any income coming in because I had lost my work and I was still trying to, I'm still trying to get out and find work that he can do. And, uh, so he, he sat there and he, and, and basically what happened is, is until he had agreed in his divorce negotiations to give his ex the house and the custody, um, he, he was going to be paying this lawsuit. So once he agreed to give her the, the house and the custody, uh, the, the father-in-law dropped a lawsuit and I had met him the day after the court, finalized his divorce. Now keep in mind, this is his story. I don't know all the details and it can bring up lots of questions. Like why didn't you stand up for yourself? And why didn't you hire an attorney? And I don't know all the details that went into that at the time I was just talking to him and he, he sat there and he, he just felt, he just, I just, he just looked defeated and, um, and, he was using all the should haves. I call it should have been all over himself, like shitting on yourself with the word should have. If you, if you look at the, the term should have, like I should have, or we should have those two words together, are very powerful. And they're very, very damaging because usually in divorce, the should have, is the indication that you're judging yourself for something. I should have done this differently. Right now, when I went through my divorce, one of the things that I did early on is I was seeing a therapist and I quickly realized that the therapist, that the interaction wasn't really that great for me. I mean, she was doing a good job and she was opening some things for me. But I didn't, I, I just felt like a lot of times I'm sitting in the chair, uh, the, the energy was really stale and she was just judging me, you know, trying to find any clues that could, that she could tie into to help me create this shift. And so I wasn't getting much out of the therapy. I went through like three sessions and I said, you know what, I'm going to call my old coach and my old coach is a. He's a business coach, but he, he brought a lot of uh, spiritual wisdom into our work. And when I started talking with my coach, he would say, I would say, 
you know, I should have like, cause I was still at the ending of an equals. I'm still asking why, why did this happen? And so this is, this is early parts of like end of you know, early parts of October before she moved out. I started meeting with him and I was, I was should having all over myself. And he said to me a phrase, which I kept and um, I constantly repeated to myself and I'm going to share this phrase with you. And it's the same phrase I shared to the guy at the counter when he was should having all over himself. Like I should have stood up for myself. I should have fought more for my kids. I should have, should have not let my father in law push me around. You know, he had a whole list of should haves. And I said to him, you know, just repeat after me. I forgive myself for judging myself as if I could do better. And that's what I said. And he, he repeated it. And when he he repeated it, he just started crying. He just broke down. He was just like, it was like, uh, you know, how sometimes guys will cry and it just is a release of emotion. And he just he just broke down. And if you didn't write those words down, write them down. I forgive myself for judging myself as if I could do better. Now, when he broke down, we talked for a little bit and I eased him through it. I was like, look, you did the best you can with what you had and what you knew. You didn't know how to handle the situation. You did the best you can with all the resources you have. And it just, the relief just started going through. And then he, he looks at me and he says, Steve, um, I, I was actually going to take my life today. I was going to drive down the road and find the first truck that was coming along and go head on into it. And I got scared and I decided to stop in here for breakfast. So, um, so he and I just talked for a little bit and I, I, you know, asked him if he wanted to go for a walk. So we walked probably for about an hour in the snow down this bike path that was behind the restaurant. And I just talked to him and I, I, uh, I made real progress. Like I, I could see that, that I had to shift um, created in him and that he, he wasn't letting that should have phrase eat him alive. And at the end of our walk, we, um, he was like, look, this has been really helpful. Would you, would you be willing to meet with me periodically and talk? And so that's what I did. And at this time I, I was still full, full fledged financial advisor, but I would make time on a weekend morning and I would talk with them and we had our talks and sometimes he would get super angry. I mean, just really angry. And, and, um, in other times he would be, you know, he had, a, he had a, his issues that he was working through and it got to some points where I had to say, look, I'm, I, if our conversations are going to be like this, I, I have no interest in, in continuing our conversation. And eventually he'd pull back in and we, we went through probably for about eight or nine weeks, maybe 10 weeks. Um, I met with them and talked to him. Meanwhile, I had been seeing this, this girl and she would be like, see, I told you, I told you, <laughs> you're, you're, you're supposed to be helping men. And, uh, and that was the start. That was the, the push for me to open up my eyes and say, Hey, you're, um, there's something here. Go, go explore that. And this is before my gap my gap year and 
this is everything. But like, like, you know, I guess you could imagine when you're, you're going through your own transition, there's something in your heart that's saying, go, go do that. And you're looking at all your responsibilities and obligations. It's hard to go off and do that. So I still, you know, I, I would dip a toe in here and there. And shortly after I had met another guy, second guy I, I started working with. And he was the first, first one that I had asked to compensate me for our time together. And, you know, his situation, he is, he went within three months, he went into retirement. Um, his partner left him, his wife left him and his mother died all within three months. And he had some, some issues that he was working through. And, uh, I approached that relationship with a great deal of confidence because I felt after the, the one guy I had met, um, that, you know, I, I have the ability to handle difficult situations. And so that's what I, uh, proceeded to do. Now, here I am five years later, and that's how my journey started. And, and my ultimate goal for, for not only you, but for your families is to bring pieces in that just help you transition in a healthy way. These, these little nuances that we do to ourselves in divorce, the should haves, the blame, the judgment, perceiving things the wrong way, the toxic dance, all these things can be mitigated, if not completely removed. And they, but we go through unconsciously and we allow these things to occur. And the more we allow them, the more we, we get ourselves stuck. And sometimes the situations can be so bad where, you know, you're thinking about the ultimate uh, way out, like he was, like this guy at the counter was. And it's not worth that. It's just, it's not worth that. Um, this is this is an ending. Uh, it's an ending that you're going through. But you tell me something in life where something ends and something doesn't immediately start to begin from there. Right? There's always life after an ending. Tree dies and falls down on the ground. There's new life that comes in. I mean, it's just the way that's just the way it all works. It's the way the cycle goes. And our stories don't end when we go through our separation or our divorce. In fact, that's just the start. That's the starting point for the second mountain. It's the starting point to go into the new phase. And when we go in that new phase, what prevents us from moving into that new, new phase is when we get locked in to things like the should-haves. And it's, it's a way to shit all over yourself. And we become very good at it. But in reality, each of you have a story. And whether you're in an amicable divorce or just fighting to, to keep the contentiousness at bay and keep it from throwing your, your life and your situation off the rails. Each of you are doing the best you can. You know, we see the world the way we are. We don't see the world the way it is. You know, our eyes, they just have this filter on the screen and and we pick up things that match the way we are inside, not the way it is. So when we go through divorce or have a toxic marriage, we'll, we'll look out for those things. When, when you're a kid like me and you end up without a home, even though you, I had parent, uh, family members I could stay with from my parents' divorce, uh, I became hyper-vigilant, hyper-protective of all the possible things. I, I saw the world for many years the way I was, not the way it is. And when we see the world the way we are and not the way it is, then 
it's very easy for that should have to come into your life and take root. And in reality, we're doing the best we can with what we know at the time, with what we were taught, with the information we had. We did the best we can with what we knew. We, bit, we do the best we can with the resources that we have at our, avail, at our availability, right? If we lose money, we'll still do the best we can. We do the best we can given our view of the world and the way we were taught to perceive things. So this guy that was at the counter, he, he can come up with a whole list of should-haves, but the reality is, is he was doing the best he could with what he had to work with in a new situation and what he knew. But the great thing is, is that you can start to see the world differently. And it starts by looking at your situation differently. This is what I mean by having the right perception. When the perception is wrong, when the perception is around should have in the self judgment, then that thought error is released and that's is the way you act and that's the way things start to result in your life. But if we can make a shift to the perception of possibility, of, of prosperity, not of scarcity, then it, it creates a whole different path to get through this thing that we don't understand. But it's all tied into the way we see the world, but the way you see the world can shift and it can shift incrementally better and better and better. But it starts with forgiveness and forgiveness starts with forgiving yourself. So I'll end this episode on those words. I forgive myself for judging myself as if I could have done better. You did the best you could with what you had and what you know. Now our job is just to keep doing better. I want to thank you once again for taking time to listen in. If you like this episode and your your podcast service gives you the option to press a little button that says like, please do that. Also, be sure to check out my website, www.utreecoaching.com. Review the online coaching program. Um, I am going to start rolling out in the next few weeks a couple additional resources I'm excited to share with you. I'm not going to give you a hint to what they are now, but it's going to be more tools, more things that you can tap into to support yourself in a healthy transition through the process. You know, all of us have a story and we each have our own difficult time coming through and it's our journey. Nobody should take away from your journey. But just see it as your journey. And it's going to be richer when you can move from a situation that didn't serve you into a better outcome that does. And we're not alone. Take care.